thanks for showing up here. Uh, my name is Jochen. I'm working for Codecentric in Germany, uh, where I spent the past few years working mostly with reactive application frameworks. Out of one, uh, Vertex is one, which I spent a lot of time with, and I somewhat ended up becoming the maintainer of the new Scala stack and being now a project member there. And that's the stuff I want to introduce you today with, uh, what we did there, uh, what you can do with Vertex, and I guess, because I don't think that Vertex is widely known in the Scala world, what uh, Vertex in general is. First, the required slide, please rate on <laughs> using, uh, using the app. And now I'd like to get started from here on, just to give like a, a, a quick breeze on like what I ex expect from a reactive system, just to get you a little kickstart for what I'm going to do. So the first thing is let's assume a little service that we want to provide. Uh, wait, okay, I will jump this one. Like um, the core thing I'm talking about is reactive. So what does reactive actually mean? What, do, what are the properties that we want to get out of a system that is reactive? So um, here's a little example. Uh, let's uh, do a little service that we call insult as a service. So we want this guy to keep insulting us for as long as possible. Maybe some of you know him. Now the thing is this guy is actually fulfills a nice property which we call responsive, which means even if we take away part of his system, he's still going to be able to insult us to the very end. Now, this is already pretty nice, but like an additional property that I expect from the system if it came to that state is to come back. And now the next property is that now that we know situation in which our system is going to degrade, we want to be able to adapt to future situations, to deal with those better. So that's like one of the, like this basically combines the essence of reactive. Now, I was a little late with this funny painting, so other people already come, came up with a way better uh, image of that, and that's the reactive manifesto. I hope like most of you in here heard about it. So the core thing is staying responsive. Just as I said, like if we want to keep on insulting as long as possible without anyone noticing that this or that part is missing from our system, how do we achieve that? Part of this is being resilient, which means I can handle uh, things going wrong in my system, partial, more than partial failures in the system should not cause the customer who wants to be getting insulted missing out on insults. So the next thing is we want to be elastic, which means I want to scale out according to the demands. If there are suddenly five or ten people showing up on my bridge, I want to deal out equally to every one of those. Also, if there's only one person or no person showing up, I want to be able to scale down, which is an important property for reactive systems. as we are deploying a lot of the stuff, or most of the stuff actually, in the cloud, and every machine we deploy additionally is money on the, uh, that we spend. So we want to be elastic, and we want to adjust to the demand that we are actually facing. Now, the solution, like so, like the basis of this whole idea is, as you, maybe all of you, is building systems on the message-driven approach. That means instead of having a tight coupling with synchronous calls, we decouple all involved parts of the system and make them message-driven. So this all together forms the all-holy all cross of the reactive systems, and we're all safe. All, everything is good from now on. So this is like the one thing that we want to achieve, and I have to say, like after working for many, oh, several years with those systems, we get pretty close using them correctly. So now to the one I want to introduce to you today, Vertex. So um, Vertex has been around for a pretty long time by now. I started working with it around four or five years ago. Before that, I think it's been around now for six years. It is mainly uh, focused on the Java world, but like from my perspective, we mostly use Java in there as the C, like it's the low-level code we use, and we then try to abstract into other languages and provide decent APIs. So what is Vertex in its core? First of all, it's completely messaging-based. That means like every interaction that we have in Vertex is based on the exchange of messages between the individual parts. What parts these are, I will explain later. The next thing is, and this is like one of the nicest features of Vertex, is that it has probably one of the simplest way of creating resilient clusters that I have seen so far. We will later see a lot of code on that. We have a very simple threading model which means that um, there's really just a few core rules you have to learn to actually start working with Vertex. This is actually a part where we deliberately say we don't want to give too much flexibility to the user, but if there's one thing that is easy to get wrong, it's threading. So we have a very tightly regulated threading model in there. And the other part is that we try to keep the core 
very small. So you have like a base set of APIs that you can build on. And we have a, lot, um, a pretty big module ecosystem built around it. So, and this is like the greatness of Vertex that I've been using in both fast data system, microservice applications, a lot in the IoT and RAM rent. This is just like a little excerpt, so you know that uh, I'm not talking about a framework that's used by no one. This is just a little excerpt from uh, the companies that are currently using and boasting using uh, Vertex right now. There's a lot of no names in there. Um, so it's something that's actually pretty widely used. And if you don't know it, Vertex is completely funded by Red Hat. So like, I'm not a Red Hat employee. Like, I'm like one of the committers who's not part of Red Hat. But I think there's right now five or six people who are employed by Red Hat who are uh, just focused on uh, evolving Red, uh, Vertex. So first thing before I start digging into the code, it's like just to show you like, what is uh, offered by Vertex. I say the Vertex is highly modular. That means like, we have a lot of stuff that you can sla uh, just slap on and use. So there's the first thing that is like the database clients. There's a lot of them. Why do we have uh, specific uh, database clients? The thing is, Vertex is completely non-blocking. We don't allow any blocking code inside Vertex. That means that we have to abstract away some of those drivers so we have uh, a better handling inside the event loops. Next part is authentication. We have a rich uh, set of things to pick from. Uh, configuration, which is a pretty recent addition, so we can update run uh, update runtime. Uh, like change, we can adapt to changes in the configuration during runtime. We can go like with Kubernetes config maybe. We can go to a Spring config server, and we can update during runtime. Integration. So this is like a, this is like my catch-all thing. Like this is just everything that just connects to somewhere else. So we have ways of integrating with the JEE legacy world, where we can just hook into the event bus of Vertex and start receiving events from there. We have uh, Camel integration, AMQP integration, and the most recent additions are Kafka and gRPC. So if you just uh, saw the talk by Petra, um, there's, uh, gRPC is a pretty recent thing by Google, and Vertex is capable of being both a client and a server for gRPC. Then we have DevOps support. That means like we have a rich set of providing metrics. Uh, we have ways of log, uh, logging into the system by providing a shell login based on Telnet or a secure shell. Um, we have specific Docker images and all that stuff. Discovery, that means that like, we can hook up into like, other systems to discover services that we want to use. Pretty important if you're in the cloud and you don't want to hard code any IPs or something like that. And then the important part to me, cluster manager, that means like the ways nodes can discover each other. Hazelcast has been, by history, the, uh, the most used one and the most flexible one. <clears throat> but we also have JGroups integration, Apache Ignite, and Zookeeper. So you can pick whatever you want there. And then the miscalculus. Um, OK, I don't pronounce this word now. Um, the most recent and biggest addition has been on a full-fledged MQTT server in Vertex, which allows us now to uh, interact with IoT devices. It's already, already used by the Almas product from uh, Red Hat. It's, to my knowledge, also used by Bosch for many of the high-throughput applications in the IoT scenario. Now, for the one thing, um, all of these modules are, through the work I did, available in a Scala flavor. So there's no part of the API where you have right now Java leaking through to you. So you will be able to use all of these modules with a Scala native API. And that brings me to the next point. Vertex is, by choice, uh, a polyglot framework. So now, polyglot on the JVM, many people think, yeah, that's a pretty easy thing. Uh, because like every language on the JVM can, by theory, interact with any other language or libraries generated by it. The key thing is that we take a lot of work um, to support languages natively, which means all modules are available in a flavor for their appropriate language. We added a lot of type information in our Java core to support this so that we can then generate appropriate APIs for the different languages. Currently supported are obviously Java 8 as the core, JavaScript, we got Groovy, we got Salem, we got Kotlin. Kotlin is probably like the most recent edition, which just came out with 341, I think, and Scala, which I thought would be like a four week test to implement, and I ended up spending five or six months until it was completed. So those are the languages you can use, uh, currently use Vertex with. As all, like, obviously, there's many uses in the Java area, but we have, uh, I think, an equal amount of people using JavaScript, Groovy, Kotlin, Scala. I have no idea how many people are using the Salem stuff, 
but like uh, we see in the community that the actual native adapters are used pretty widely. So, first of all, like the basics of Vertex. So, like what is Vertex in its core? The most important thing we always talk about is a so-called handler. This is like a, a thing that you will see in my calculator passed around a lot. A handler has a few unique features. Feature number one is each handler has an inbox. You might somewhat see a relation to other concepts from another reactive framework here, and it's clear that we're inspired by that one too. So each handler has an inbox. Why do we have an inbox? Well, because um, a handler will never be executed by more than one thread. The concept behind it is a so-called event loop. That means like, um, we have this event loop, and all our handlers are by some magic way that I'll show you server, uh, later on, associated with one thread for their full lifetime. So that means if I have tons of handler registered, they will have to be executed in sequence. That's why we have this inbox there. This also gives us another unique property. By giving this guarantee that each handler is always executed by the same thread and never executed concurrently, this means we're thread safe in there. There's, you don't, won't need any synchronization, atomics, or whatever else you know from a construct, you're thread safe in there. So now, a handler can register to the event bus. The event bus is the nervous system of Vertex. Every part of Vertex exchanges information using this event bus. The naming is a little wrong, I would say, by now on, because, like, but there has been a long discussion about events and messages over the past few years. Thankfully, Roland Kuhn clarified the whole thing in his uh, Reactive Messaging Patterns book, a very recommended read. So actually, we should call this message bus, but for historic reason, it's an event bus. So a handler can register itself to the event bus under a given address. You decide what address you want to pick. This can be influenced by technical aspects, by uh, business effect, uh, aspects, whatever you want there. So a handler can receive messages. Next part is handlers are responsible for handling I.O. Whatever we do, if you interact with a file, a socket, whatever else, handlers will the ones who receive the working packages. Under the hood, just as a little side remark, Vertex is complete, uh, completely based on Netty, Netty 4.1 right now. So that's also like we get a pretty amazing performance with I.O. operations there. So this is basically it. These are the building blocks, the handler and the event loop. Now, the nice thing is, as I already said before, these handlers can re are registered now to the event bus. We have um, uh, multiple handlers can, uh, can register there. We even allow handlers to register under the same name, which allows us to do instant uh, round robin there. That is a property I'll show later on if you go in the clustered mode. And the other part is that the event bus works equally well distributed. And this is, like I think, one of the core features. The program mo pro programming model does not differ between local and distributed mode. You never know. You don't care. If the message is processed locally, you have control if you really want to enforce local processing, but in the most cases, you will just send out a message and maybe expect an answer. But what machine in your cluster is actually handling it, you don't care. That's something that's taken over and handled by the cluster manager, which has just showed you that there are a couple of implementations there. So now, before we continue, like on the topic of exactly once delivery. Well, we have the same problem as Akka. There is none. We have uh, at most once delivery, so it means best effort. You have several ways, like we have also like something like the ask pattern in Akka, so you have to ensure if you really want, like if it's not fire and forget, if you really care that somebody processed your message, you will have to take care of that. So, and right now we arrived at the coding part. Uh, I recently created a Gitterate uh, template for it, so this is all you need to type into your machine with a recent, I think, 0.13.15 version of SPT uh, supports it correctly, to get started with a full uh, Vertex project. And this is what I'm going to show you right now, what you get if you execute this command. So thing number one is, I fear it's a little like, over there, but like the general light does not interest. Let's take a look first at the build SPT. There's everything in there that you need to create fat jars and Docker images. So you can instantly just code your fancy little microservice and generate a Docker image or a fetcher out of this. The most interesting part of this is that I manage the dependencies for you. I just showed you that we have a tremendous amount of modules available. And if we just jump in here, all available modules are there for you. The only thing you have to do is add the dependency in your built SPT, and you can start moving in there. 
In here, the only modules I include is Vertex Lang Scala, which is the actual language adapter. I include Vertex Web and Scala Test. This down here is a nasty little let over because like, uh, the Scala compiler will emit warnings if I have annotations that it doesn't find in the class path. So that's the reason why this one is there. So let's take a look what we got in here. The first interesting part in here is this. It's the HTTP vertical, which I'm going to elaborate a little more on. Um, and it shows like how Vertex actually works. I told you that handlers and everything else is associated with an event loop. So the question is, like, where does this event loop reside? In here. That's the vertical. That's the thing that Vertex got its, its name actually from. Each time I create a vertical, this vertical is associated with one thread for its full lifetime. In there, I have now multiple options. You see, first of all, the start future method. You see it returns a future. Because everything we do in Vertex is async. As I told before, we are not allowed to block. So if I create a, uh, a, um, a server, a net server, for example, that takes some time. But Vertex would just tell me, go on. Here you got a future. If you want to know if it succeeded, take a look at the future. And that's what I do in here. I create a router, which is coming from Vertex Web. I tell it, for a get request to hello, I want you to send world. And down here, um, the actual part happens. I have create HTTP server. That directly spawns an Eddy instance under the hood. I register my request handler. That means like this router I defined up here is now responsible for handling all incoming requests. And then I call the method listen future. There's also a listen method that just say like I don't care, like ignore the future. Listen future returns a future, and I tell it bind to this port and these IP addresses. I want to bind to every IP address on my machine. That's it. And with that, I already got a web server up and going. The second part that you get in here is for the event bus that we're going to see in action in, uh, in a few moments. Um, here, I accept, um, access again the vertex object. I get the actual event bus. I register a consumer under this address. That means from, these moment, from this moment on, I'm reachable under this address. And all I do is just like each time a message is coming in, I reply to the message, which might be uh, uh, look familiar if you know the ask pattern from Akka, with hello world. And this completion feature is actually the interesting part because, again, we're running in a mostly distributed system. That means this future will complete with when the cluster manager tells me registered. That means like if it's propagated in the cluster, that uh, the cluster knows this instance is now reachable under test address. Further down here are a few tests. That's for you to take a look at later on. Um, there's full test integration already available. It's based on a plain vanilla Scala test. There's a little helper class here, and that's it. So now further, because like I don't want to spend too much time on this simple example. I will move forward to get actually something running. So that takes a moment. Please don't start downloading. Yes, thank you. OK, now we get some more classes down here. And this is like the first thing we're going to take a look at. This is basically one way to use Vertex. Vertex can be completely embedded in your application. You can run it as a fetcher, and you can run it on the command line. So there's all kinds of ways of using this. For testing and for demos, I prefer this way of doing it, because I can show what I'm actually doing. The first thing I do is I launch clustered Vertex. Clustered Vertex mean, please bring up the cluster manager, in this case, Take a look at the build SBT. It will be Hazelcast. So next thing is now this method will, um, as soon as the instan uh, instance is up and connected to the actual cluster, I can return and then I can de uh, start deploying my verticals. In this case, I will de deploy the HTTP vertical. Another thing, you will never have access to the instance of a vertical directly. This is done to basically just tell Vertex to spawn this thing. We really, really want to keep you cradled and safe by not allowing you to do any nasty things by having the actual instance in your hand. So back into the HTTP workload, and that has grown a little. First thing we see up here, I created a sender. Sender is basically an abstraction that allows me now to send messages to the event bus, always to the same address. Still have my router here. You see to hello world, but I also added another get request. Oh, let's make this more visible. Another get request that will answer to hello again. And if we look in here, that's where I use the sender. 
This sender will now, each time, when I call send futures, or I send the, world, uh, the, the word world to test address, and wait for a reply. That's implied by the future that's coming back. So I really, I want to see this thing come back. back. And now, like in Akka, you have the syntactic sugar with the question mark. We don't have this right now. So let's take a look how this thing looks if I run it. So let's get started. We see a lot going on down here. This is basically Hazelcast coming up and registering the first cluster member, as we see here. And now let's take, the, uh, let's take a look at the hello URL. And as expected, we get a world back. So that's the easiest case. Now, if we take a look again at the code that I just wrote, you see here, we wait for a message to come back. And if you don't get any message back, the failure says, no one is here. So it means like nobody is answering on this address right now. Let's, try, uh, uh, let's play around with this, uh, with this case. Oh, no. Hello again. And we are now sad servers is not receiving any answers. So how do we get these answers going now? And I'll inst instantly start this by actually spawning a separate VM. Here's a separate runner. So that means like if I run this, this will actually spawn a new JVM. So I bring up this JVM. We see now, again, a lot of stuff going on down here. And we see a nice little thing here. We see now two cluster members. If we look at the other JVM, we also see another JVM has joined. And if I go now in here and hit reload, we get a hello world with this hash code. So oh, I didn't show you. I actually modified this vertical. So this is basically taking the incoming message, appending, prepending hello, and um, getting the hash code into a header. So, if I retry, same again, and same again. Now, this is already pretty nice. So, th this means I can just bring up as many JVMs as I want, and they will join each other. And this is also true in a distributed system. In the default mode, Hazelcast will use uh, UDP multicasting to find, uh, find other instances, but you can use TCP. We already embedded in, in Kubernetes, where you can use the Kubernetes service discovery. Um, no, the Hazelcast SPI, which is based on the Kubernetes tagging facility, so that every node that you have that has running um, a Vertex instance can join this whole cluster. So, and just to prove that this is actually working, I launch the next one. So now I will have two instances running off my bus vertical. We see down here it joins the cluster instantly. And if I go up here, we see the hash code change. And this is the other unique property. I launched the same vertical twice in different VMs. Each of the VMs registers the test address. We figure out, like the cluster manager sees, OK, there are now two instances. And each time uh, we want to send to an instance, it does an automatic round robin. It's currently a non-weighted route roaming. That's something I want to work on in the future to get other algorithms in there. But our community is pretty happy with, with what they have right now. So I can just add machines and machines and machines. And the system will take care to spread out the load over all of these machines. So that's it for showing you how the cluster actually works. So this is, this is already pretty easy. But there's other things that I really love about this. Let's go to the next example. And another set of kudos to Heiko Seeberger for the g plug plugin SPT. This is like the, the best thing I've seen in a while. So this time, I added a new vertical, which is the chat vertical. Let's take a look at this. I just told you that the event bus is actually spreading across the whole cluster, connecting each of the nodes. What we also did is the event buster can stretch into your browser using uh, WebSockets. So what we can do is just that we can connect a browser uh, directly to our, uh, to our running system. So let's take a look how we achieve this. So there's a few more things now in here, but let's focus on this here. You see I add a new handler from the init SOCJS method, and you see down here. So this is the core of this. Like we use SOCJS in the background to 
allow the browser to communicate with us what kind of interaction it actually prefers. So like the default is WebSocket, it can fall back on long polling and other, other mechanisms to mimic the behavior of WebSockets. Then we establish the bridge. And that's the key thing. So we won't simply allow the browser to connect to our internal system. That would be suicide. What we can do in here is, this is just like the most basic thing I can do. In default mode, it won't allow any message to pass back and forth between the system and the browser. So I have to explicitly allow what can go out of my system. And I can specifically allow what can go into my system. I can use all kind of Y cards in there to specify more closely. And I can even have content batches that will take care that only well-formed messages actually enter the system. So this is a pretty tough defense. It's like more closely to a firewall that we have in place in there. So um, this is part one. Part two is, and that's the chat UI up here. So like I went fancy and did React, and then I learned that React is already dead. Like all, everything in the, sky, in the JavaScript dies within like 24 hours. So the key thing we have in here is just like there is distributed uh, via NPM. So you get it with your standard JavaScript dependency management. There is the whole event plus client is available in the regular JavaScript repositories. That's the one thing we, uh, we put in here. And then what we do is, the only thing we have to do is we instantiate our event bus. So this is like basically like as soon as the application opens, it will do a connect back. And then we have the, the sending part down here, which basically just, just takes back information and then sends a message on the event bus. We also register a, uh, a listener. Uh, Oh, that's in the list, exactly. So up here is the interesting code. What I do in there, I register a handle for the address browser. And first of all, I lock everything that's coming in on the console. And I append the message to my existing list of messages. So what you now may be realizing is that this is a, a, a chat application that I just came up here with. So, how does this actually work? Um, I'll fire up the, uh, the whole thing. Oh, wrong prod. Right. So, as you see here, I do, I have an example, another example, like I deploy the chat vertical, I give it some options with it. In this case, I specify the port, so that is how you provide configuration in a static way. We also have the dynamic way with the configuration managers. So now I just fire up this whole thing. I hope I didn't have anything else running. Oh, crap, I have. Wait. Crap. Oh, no, I killed the wrong one. Now we start. <clears throat> so the application is up and running. So I'm going to open my chat. So I write a message down here. OK, great, I see my own message. We already see that it's, it has been enriched on the server side because I appended some information about the date. But now, let's open a second browser. So the message is over here. So you see, this is a pretty powerful constructor. We've already been using this for uh, online gaming uh, and IoT application because this, this really means like we can't Based on a WebSocket connections, we can just exchange information over the sockets with allowing someone to register a handler for that. It also makes it tremendously easy to get interactions with the system going. Just as you, if you look, I mean, like this is, it's not the nicest, like it, it won't be a competition to Slack or, or any other, but take a look at the amount of code we just needed to set up a full um, chat server. This is basically the work of me just spending 10 to 15 minutes uh, on, on coding this whole example. The other interesting part that I just wanted to point out is like just serving static content. This is also like a, just a small addition that we have to do here by adding the static handler, which will automatically resolve everything that's here in WebRoot on the class path. I can specify it on the file system. I can allow it to reload from the file system if I want to edit around in there. So I have all kinds of possibilities for interacting uh, with stuff in here. So let's move on to the next part. 
Next part is going to show you how you can integrate a full-fledged shell in your application. This is like a very useful thing that I learned when working for certain big companies that won't allow me to look on the machine, <laughs> but forget to close the telnet port. So um, there are other situations where you want to debug your application. Or just you want to introduce to do some quick checking on a running application. One way is you can just get out the metrics. For metrics, we have Hocular support, Drop Wizard, and all kinds of other. We're currently abstracting it more away so we can directly write to things like InfluxDB and those things that is currently being thought of, how we can achieve that. But right now, what's again interesting is, let's take a look at this launcher for now. As you've seen before, I just had the chat vertical deployed in here. In here. But now I added another one. This is basically a way of deploying a service in, uh, in Vertex. So all I do is, in my build SBT, I add a dependency to the shell service. And then I tell the system, please deploy the service that is registered under this name, which is available on the class path. All I do is, I give it the telnet option. So I specify I want to bring up telnet for now. I, like I, didn't, I really didn't want to mess around now with key storage. So, like, so you would normally pick as secure shell. I hope nobody thinks that telnet is a nice option. So what it specifies, Please bind to localhost on port 4000. So, and we start this again. So, the server is up and going. I again open my local chat. Let's go, let's get rid of those. We open another one so we see the interactions with there. So this should be here. Yes, it is. And now let's go. Uh, let's log in via Telnet. And here we are. So we're right now locked into the, the Vortex runtime. Let's look what options we have in here. There's a couple of commands that are registered. You can add your custom commands to this. And I think the most interesting one is now bus tail. So we want to see what's going on on the browser address. So now this is like a, like a standard command line tail. I'll go in here, uh, now in the browser. I'll type hello world. And looking in here, we now see the exact JSON message I'm sending to the browser from the inside of Vertex. So this is like also like a pretty nice and powerful feature to debug, um, to debug your application, or you can have like other control options in there because you can just add your custom commands and extend this thing a lot more. Now, this is already pretty nice. Um, the one thing that is currently missing that I'm working on for Vertex Scala is that I don't really have a nice streaming API right now. You may be like, um, I can reduce a lot of things by uh, using the Scala futures, so we don't have like the callback hell that you might know from Node.js and all the systems, so we can reduce this. But having something like Akka streams or like Rx Java or Rx Scala in there would be pretty nice. Now, what the situation is that Rx Scala 2 is not yet there, like they are working on it. And I didn't want to get Rx Scala in there, and I had like a little side project that I was working on, like to get a deeper understanding of reactive streams. So a new thing that I'm currently adding, and which is something I hope that maybe some people are interested in taking a look at for the future, is Vertex Streams, which is a pretty recent thing I started working on, which provides like, uh, I, won't even I don't even want to compare myself to like, what Akka Streams is currently providing because it's way, way bigger. But it basically provides back-pressured streams. I haven't mentioned before, all parts of Vertex are back-pressured, are back-pressure capable. That means like, we already use the, whole, like, the high watermarks feature for native for all I.O. interactions. That means like, uh, everything you do like, with files and sockets is already back-pressured. On the event bus, we added this, I think, with 3.3 or 3.4. That means like, since then, if you interact over the event bus, you can. You don't have to. But you can rely on back-pressure information, which means I get tokens from, one, from the other side, from the receiving end, to tell me that I can continue sending. Like it's like a very basic form that we have in there. So, but like making this actually more usable and more flexible, because right now we can just pump, like this is the construct we use, like messages of type JSON to another receiver of type JSON, but so we need at least a little map operation in between. I started actually working on Vertex Streams, which is the, 
is currently only available on my personal repository. And just to show you if, uh, like what I'm actually going for is like I simply integrated Akka into Vertex. So I committed some heresy, uh, so I just took like one reactive application framework and crammed it into another reactive application framework and connected those two using reactive streams. And this is the part that actually worked, to my surprise, pretty nicely. So what we ha have over here is, again, I define a producer. The producer is already what we call in Vertex a write stream, so it's like it's something I just can write to. The producer itself has all the back pressure information required, I just have to use it. So in this case, I tell it, I want to send everything to the receiver address, which is called the sync address. Then I start by creating an ACA flow. So as you can see here, uh, you probably can't read this, this is really just a reactive streams publisher. The reactive streams publisher is, if you have seen the talk from Heiko, I create my ACA system, my actor system, I create the materializer, then I create a source. In this case, the only thing I want is the source that emits the values from 0 to 101. I map the whole thing, and then I do a run with. So, in this case, I tell it to take this whole thing and convert it into a publisher, which means now I have like an, an, an open water pipe that's going to pump out my values. And up, up here, I use my stream method, like I use the pip my library pattern here to get this in place here. I connect my sync. My sync is my producer in this case. So basically what this means is Akka is producing the, um, the values, and I'm just pumping them out to the event bus. And down here, I start the whole thing. We now take a little look at the actual runner. What the runner actually uh, um, does right now is just I, I do a little more than I normally do in here. I create a Vertex instance. This time, I didn't create a clustered one. This is really just when you want to run locally, because I just want to taste this functionality. I create my Vertex execution context. This is normally taken uh, care of by the vertical, but I don't have a vertical in here, so I have to actually provide the execution context to run on. And then I'm able to register a consumer to the address that my flow, will go, um, that my stream is going to send every, um, every value to. And all I do is I make a print line and print out all the values that are coming in. So, and let's run this whole thing. So down here again. So here we go. So this is basically the part that I hope to add to Vertex with uh, version 3.5. Uh, there's still going to be a lot of work going on in this area. This is definitely not done yet, but I'm already pretty satisfied like how things interact. And for me, like the, the actual proof of concept was really to get something other that's based on reactive streams to connect to my stream and use it in there. So this was actually a lot faster than I expected. It's the first time I give this talk this way. <laughs> So the streams are like the next com uh, thing coming up. Version 3.4.2 of Vertex is going to be released in the next two weeks. Uh, it's going to, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's going to be a pretty significant release because right that's the release that I consider the Scala support to be stable. We had a lot of input from the community, from people trying it out and playing around with it. We solved several problems, with a, mostly based around the idea like how we actually generate the whole API. So with 3.4.2, this thing is actually in a stable state, so there's no more API changes to be expected. And that's the part where I start like, with some deeper benchmarking. Uh, right now, we just did like, some basic benchmarking to see like, that the performance is at least somewhere in the area where we expected it to be. I hope at some point to get some time to get also in the Tech Empower benchmark, which Vertex is already part of, and we're always like, in the top 10 or top 20 of those frameworks tested in there. And for today, I would say I showed you what I wanted to show. I was a lot faster than I expected. I'm sorry, but I guess like everyone is also waiting for the party. So, questions? Yes? Uh, oh, I have, I have so many questions. <laughs> uh, I'm here for tomorrow, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, about resilience? Yes. 
So for resilience and clustering, then you would register uh, one or more handlers on each node because you don't know which nodes they go to. Exactly. Um, but that it is in a cluster is abstracted away, right? So there is no guarantee that there is any handlers for a name at any given point in time. So there's um, there's a few things uh, I do like. It really depends on how you design. There's like what I didn't show you because like there's so many features I could show you is there's a high availability mode in Vertex where you can register bare instances which will look like they see in the cluster if an instance goes away. So you mark an instance. Okay, this is important that it keeps running. And if it registers via the cluster manager that the instance is gone, so it's reached the heartbeat timeout, it will replace the instance and instantly deploy the missing part. The other thing I normally do is just like, I normally rely heavily on monitoring. Like it's like, I don't think it's the property of a framework to handle every type of occurring failure. Like that's what we have monitoring for. The key thing is that we can recover from failure as fast as possible. That means if I start throwing new instances, so I like my monitoring registers a sudden peak in uh, usage. I need to be able to just throw new instances in there and they instantly take over work and start consuming. If instances break away, that's something that I normally see with uh, uh, systems like Instana, AppDynamics, or whatever. Like they see that like something got corrupted and it's gone. So, and they will then tell Kubernetes or whatever, just like, gone, do something, and then they rejoin. That's no like how I design it, uh, the applications for resilience. So I take care like, um, so that I have a way to realize like, when a machine is gone, I can deploy additional things to uh, load, of, um, uh, like if you have reach wearing load, I normally rely completely on the monitoring system because that has mostly more accurate information than Vertex will ever have. Because in that case, like the whole Vertex cluster would have to be aware of how like the load behaves. And that's something that I delegate to the monitoring system. Okay, thank you. I, I will ask one more when I anyways <laughs> have the microphone. I just need to choose carefully. Uh, Any more questions? Over there, what's there? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so the question was like, what is like the, the difference between this and the ESP? So simply, it isn't an ESP, it's a messaging bus. Like an ESP is like, it's a, it's a lot more like, with ESP you have ETL operations, you have the management of like, authentication, authorization of the different receivers. You can control like who, act like, like that's the lies they told us that like you can decide for each data item, like which data item is going to reach which service and so on. It simply isn't an ESP. Like it's, this is like, we can integrate with a lot of different frameworks, but if you want to go like the ESP way, that's like where you take Mule or Camel or Alpaca or, or one of those. We can connect to these. For us, it's really, um, this is a distributed system that relies on a distributed event bus. That's it. I, don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't call this an ESP. It's just like the event bus is the way the whole cluster communicates with each other. So I don't see a relation to an ESP. You could definitely build an ESP, but I think you can build an ESP with Perl. So. <laughs> and judging from the performance of so most of them are probably built with Perl. Yes? Oh, well, uh, sorry, one was already over there. Just. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> When you put those access rights to to inbound, <coughs> outbound yeah. messages, uh, where is that kept? Is that also a distributed thing, those rules? No, because um, that's the point where we actually create a socket. That's basically where, no, no, not a socket, you create a handler that means like you delegate down to Netty and tell Netty, for incoming connections, be, please call this handler. So each time a new WebSocket connection is brought up, we will execute like the limits, like we would pull the limits on this connection. So this is handled on a per node basis. Right, so that was local to that vertical. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then over there. Uh, so you showed us the sharding, can, no. so show the sharding uh, functionality of Vertex. Can it be, is it like similar to Akka and does it have like a sharding rebalancing if something goes nope. down? Uh, I started implementing sh actual, actual sharding, so like we don't really have sharding right now. Like sharding means like I can split like on, on certain addresses and things. Um, the event bus is extremely low level on that. It allows you to implement your own sharding logic, which I already did for, for some other projects. So this is like, basically you build it on top of the event bus. Um, 
there are other ways of, of managing traffic. So like uh, I just gave you a short glimpse, like you can add headers to messages and all that. So you have the payload and you can add headers, which can then be used for advanced routing interactions. That's what I mostly do, but sharding is not built in. So like that's something that you will have to come up on your own. Cool, thank you. Yes. Uh, I just have a question about the, when you showed the shell, when you're telling us to the shell, yeah. there was a few uh, programs for handling local maps. Well, what kind of uh, things uh, are stored in the local maps? Uh, can you repeat this, please? When you showed the shell, there were commands for lo handling local maps. Yeah. What kind of stuff is stored in there? Um, so, like, the, 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 the core thing is we don't have we don't have shared state. Like we don't allow shared state in uh, in Vertex. So even like if you pass a message, the message goes through a copy operation, so you don't have, hold a reference. Now, there are situations in which you kind of want to share some information. The local maps are uh, like there to share immutable instances of things in a local way. There are also distributed maps, which are then hold up in the cluster manager. But like the local maps allow you to share certain immutable information between the verticals. So like configuration information or like uh, some some other meta information that you got can be put in there and can be read by other verticals in a thread safe way without blocking. Any more questions? I'm like if there are more people or if people want to talk, like I'm around here. I even got stickers for those who are really excited now about Vertex. So I guess um, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I'm looking forward to the party and maybe talk with some of you about Vertex and other uh, reactive issues. Thank you.